Hello, and welcome to another module in CIS 121 Computer Concepts 2 at Portland Community College. My name is Al Zimmerman. In this example, we're going to take a really simple problem, come up with a really simple solution, and then we're going to flowchart that solution and write some pseudocode to describe that solution. It's really a pretty simple thing, so it'll be easy for you to understand. The important thing is to watch how we take what is a pretty basic instruction and break it down so that we add enough detail that it's an appropriate way of communicating the solution using flowcharts and pseudocode. The important thing here is to break down the ideas and the instructions so that a person who is new to the situation, new to the problem, can understand. You need to be explicit and unambiguous, so use very simple language, use simple imperative sentences, do this, do that. But don't go into any more detail than you need to. Don't make people read too much. Just give them what they need to know. And we'll talk about how you find that boundary. Most importantly, in our situation, don't write code. Now, as you've seen in the materials, there's a form of pseudocode which is very close to a programming language. And someone who doesn't know much about programming can use it and can crank out code based on your pseudocode. We're talking about something at the other end of the system development life cycle, up in the analysis phase and in the early stages of design, where we're going to write pseudocode that's more intended for humans, so that you can have a conversation with your customer and find out, is this going to work for you? And then you can refine it further and give it to your programming staff or yourself and turn it into a language. The most important idea about not writing code is you want to write pseudocode that will work for any computer language. It should be language independent. So let's take a hypothetical problem. Um, someone needs to buy some shoes. Now, for some reason, uh, this person has never bought shoes before. Uh, maybe they're a princess, and someone has always bought shoes for them before this. So you have been hired to teach them how to go buy shoes. Now, they obviously need princess shoes, um, but it turns out this princess is also a triathlete, and like every other member of the royals in her country, she's a member of the armed forces. In her case, she's a paratrooper. So she needs princess shoes, she needs athlete shoes, and she needs combat boots. Uh, three different kinds of shoes. So we have to write a process that will help her figure out how to buy shoes. Kind of silly. Oh well. Now you could just tell her, go buy three pairs of shoes. And that certainly is unambiguous. Uh, there's the flow chart for it. It's one step. Buy three pairs of shoes. It starts and stops pretty much there. Clearly, we're going to need some more detail than that. But the question is, how much detail? What are the steps that go into this simple process? And more importantly, which ones should we show and which ones should we leave out? It all starts with the context. What's the situation? What can we assume and what do we have to have as part of the process? So you have to ask yourself some questions. Does the person who I'm writing this for, do they know about shoe styles? Do they know that there's a different style of shoe for athletes than there is for um, armed forces, for paratroopers? Uh, do they know their own shoe size, or do they have to discover that? Um, do they know that shoes are sold in a store? And do they have a favorite store that they want to go to? Do they want to shop online, or do they want to shop in, in uh, person? These are the kind of questions you have to ask, and depending on the answers, then you know what you can leave out. If they know exactly where they're going to go, then you don't have to tell them how to do that. But let's look at it a little closer. The other question you have to ask yourself, especially when you're writing procedures for someone to program a computer from, are really basic questions like, 
Does this person even know what a shoe is? Do they know what a shoe is good for? Do they know that you put them on your feet? If you're writing for a computer, you can't assume that. In fact, for a computer, you have to go really basic. Like, do we know that this person knows how to count? Now, for a human, obviously you can buy, put a pair of shoes down, put another one down, put another one down, and you say, well, there's three pairs of shoes there. I don't have to do that. You teach a child, well, one, two, three. Computers are like children. So in our case, we're going to have an interesting mix of there are some things that we can assume and that are out of scope that we don't have to describe, and there are some things that we have to pay attention to because we're writing a process that will eventually be computerized. So let's go through this. So my first stab at writing a procedure for going to the store and buying some shoes, buying three pairs of shoes, looks like this. Go to the shoe store, buy a pair of shoes, buy another pair of shoes, buy another pair of shoes, and then go home. It's real simple. There's no looping. Each of these statements is really clear. But if this person has never bought a pair of shoes before, then maybe they need more detail in that one statement about buy a pair of shoes. So let's break that down. Inside of buy a pair of shoes, we're going to break it down and add some more detail. The first thing we're going to say is, well, walk into the store and take a look at what's available. Now this is pretty simple, so I'm not going to break it down any further. The next step is choose a style that's appropriate to what you want. Presumably a princess knows what princess shoes look like. A trained combat paratrooper knows what kind of boots she needs. So I'm going to leave it at that, that level of detail. Pick out a style that you want. Then we're going to obviously find, of that style, we're going to look at pairs of shoes until we find one that fits. Well, let's, let's look at that one a little more closely because it'll allow us to explore the whole concept of trying something out until we get it right. And then finally, you got to pay for your shoes, even if you're a princess. Now that's a complicated thing that I'm just going to declare that's out of scope. I'm not going to teach this person about money. I'm not going to teach them about credit cards. That's uh, something that is not my problem. So you can see there's kinds of, uh, you have to break down one of these steps into its sub-steps. And you have a choice. Either I don't have to break it down any further because it's, it's simple enough, people know how to do that, or I can break it down and say, I am going to just go get that off the shelf. I'm going to assume that that is not part of the system, that it's out of scope. And then you're left with the thing that you have to break down even further. In our case, it's find a pair that fits. Let's look at this in terms of a process that loops. First you choose a pair. Either you ask the salesperson to go get you a pair or you pull them off the shelf yourself. Then you try them on. You put them on your feet. And then you make a decision. Do they fit or not? If they do, then you're done. You have a pair of shoes. If they do not fit, then you have to go back and choose another pair. This is an example of a loop that tests for a condition. Choose a pair, try them on, do they fit? Choose a pair, do they, try them on, do they fit? We can use loops to remove repetitive behavior in our algorithms. For example, back at the main routine, where we have them buy a pair of shoes three times. Now we've broken down that buy a pair of shoes and we know what's inside there now, but it seems kind of silly to do it three times. So let's use a loop and use the dry principle. The dry principle is don't repeat yourself. Only write one piece of code once and use it again and again. In our case, we already know how to use buy a pair of shoes, so let's put that inside a loop. Go to the shoe store, buy a pair of shoes. Count them. Do you have three pairs? No? Go buy another pair. Count them. 
Do you have another? Do you have three pairs? When you have three pairs, then you're done and you can go home. This is an example of a loop that just counts. It doesn't need to sample any external condition. It's just counting the number of times through the loop. So let's look at our final solution, our final flowchart, our final pseudocode. Now there's a PDF file in your class materials so that you don't have to squint at the screen and see it here. I'll bring it up here and we can take a closer look at it. Notice we've got two nested loops. We've got the one nested loop that is by a pair of shoes, namely choose a pair, try them on, do they fit? Do that until you find a pair. And when you have that pair, save it for purchase. And then outside that loop, we have another loop. Do you have three pairs? Count the number of pairs you have. Do you have three of them? Well, if no, then go back, and you might want to look at a different style. You might want to, you found your princess shoes, now look for your athlete shoes. When you have three pairs, then purchase the shoes and go home. On the left-hand side, you can see the pseudocode for this written in human analysis kind of language. Go to the shoe store. Choose a style of shoes that match your needs. Choose a pair in that style to try on. Try them on. Do they fit? Then notice we have an indentation and it says if yes, continue onward below. If no, go back to choose a pair in that style with a new size. You can see that writing loops in pseudocode uh, can be a little harder to understand than a simple picture where the arrow goes back up to the top. This is a situation where you can see a diagram is better for some things and it's uh, clearer to write pseudocode for other things. So that's our example. Take a look at the PDF. You may be able to apply this technique to your assignment, which has to do with finding a class that you can register for and registering for three of them. See you in the next module.